Thank you very much. And thank you all who are in attendance today, either virtually or in person. I wish I was there in person, but unfortunately uh, not today. Uh, so welcome to session four, making integrated electromobility and renewable energy finance work. Um, it's our great, I'm uh, the chief of the transport sector group at the Asian Development Bank. And it's our great pleasure to be working with the climate compatible growth. And I'd also like to thank the UK government for the great support in this initiative. There has been an excellent series of events already today, and I hope we can do justice and try and at least match the great sessions that we have had uh, earlier uh, this afternoon, focusing on the transport. I think this session is really bringing together the energy and the transport and looking at both of the innovations and the future in, in terms of both of those sectors, e-mobility and renewable energy. I won't steal the thunder of the opening presentation, which we'll look at this, but we will see um, a think piece that has been put together looking at how these two areas, e-mobility and renewable energy, can feed off and from each other to make the business case much more successful and also look at how innovative financing can flow through that. That, that presentation, and if I just run through the session, uh, how it will, will, will operate today, that will be given by Mark Howell, who is the CCG project director. He's also jointly appointed at the Loughborough University as well as Imperial College London. James Dixon, who will also be part of that initial presentation, is a re researcher with the Transport Studies Unit and Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford, and also serves on the Advanced Electrical Systems Group at the University of Strathclyde. We'll then go to the panelists. Uh, we have four excellent panelists to give us some feedback and their thoughts on the presentation in terms of the think piece. Um, and those panelists are Pam Chang, who is a colleague of mine at the Asian Development Bank, who is specializing in what the future of transport holds for Asia and the Pacific region. She's done some excellent work recently on foresight studies and also on e-mobility and the decarbonization of the transport sector. In place of Sean Kidney, we have Michelle Horsfield, who works at the Climate Bonds Initiative. And they've been mobilizing considerable amounts of finance for climate action. I think there's a green bond, maybe we'll hear more later, up to $34 trillion uh, in, in assets. We also have Monica Gulberg from the Green Climate Fund, and she's responsible for leading and developing high impact renewable energy and energy access pipelines for the Green Climate Fund. We also have on the panel, Aman Chitkare, uh, who leads the mobility data and digitalization at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and Mobility. We will also have a second presentation, and that will be from Remeredze Kahudzai, the founder of the Electric Drive Africa. And if I may, uh, in your short bio, it said you are obsessed about e-vehicles and battery technology. I love the word obsessed, and it's great to have people who've got such great, strong desire and interest in, in this very important, and I think, hu uh, hugely growth area for transport and energy. And finally, we have Nancy Van Dyke from the World Bank, who also leads the Sustainable Mobility for All, Some for All program at the World Bank. And if you were had the opportunity to join the last session, um, a very good session uh, jointly with Some for All. Um, so that is the overall program. I think uh, we can hand over now to, to Mark or James, whoever will be giving the initial presentation. Over to you, Mark. scene setting and looking at the context and then hand over to James. One of the brilliant things about working in such, uh, such nice partnerships as with the ADB, Some for All and uh, GCF and others that are in this panel and helping work on this work stream, including our, uh, our uh, university partners, is there's a, there's a wealth of really smart people to hand over to. So I'll set, set the context up and then get in and then... Um, and then James will get into the, the difficult bits and communicate those much better than I could. So I want to pick up, in fact, from the last session. So for those, those who weren't in the last session, uh, we, there was a launch of a Sum for All paper, which is really important. And it picks out some of the problems associated with not, just, not taking a more nuanced view of transport electrification in the South. All right? 
But I want to I want to go back to one of the examples uh, there, and this was for uh, for for Lao. We ran together with the World Bank and a number of others some detailed models for the energy sector and the transport sector of Lao looking into the into the future. And one of the things that that our, that our models show is that it makes complete economic sense to upgrade the electric uh, sector, put in charging systems, invest in renewable energy, and start to move and, and start to create demands in the transport sector uh, for electricity with two, three uh, wheel EVs, as well as with public transport. Okay, when we do that, there are a couple of things that happen. Uh, the big one, from a macroeconomic point of view, is you start saving on oil import. Okay, and that saving in oil import is much bigger than the costs associated with up upgrading the grid and with investing in the renewable energy uh, um, uh, capacity that's required, as well as the electric vehicles. Right, so it balances out. It, it's really good sense for the uh, for the country. When you have a look at the implications for the users. The life cycle cost of transport then becomes uh, cheaper for, for consumers, which is a great thing. Um, and for uh, small business operators with two and three wheelers, their costs go down over the life cycle of those, uh, of those, of those things. Right? So we have this technology solution that creates great macroeconomics, really good uh, business sense and so on. And by the way, it happens to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, as well. So this is just one of these brilliant sort of triple dividend type things. It's, it's lovely. The problem is, is that we have issues with the, the financing of, of, of these things. It's the case that in order to make an application for these, these, these funds that cover both transport, I need to wave this hand around a bit more. I notice that I'm just focusing on the one. But the thing is, is that um, we have to cut across sectors. There has to be investment in the transport sector, investment in the transmission and distribution part of the country, as well as investment in the energy sector. So we need a very carefully drawn together policy that helps make this, this possible. These sorts of policies are in short supply. We don't, we don't see a lot of them. We need um, large scale finance that's willing to, that, that's in vehicles that are able to service that sort of integrated uh, the integrated policy that's required. And then we need regulations to help with the business models that are needed for the small operators as well as, as others. So, trans so this, this finance is, is a particular issue. And the, the thing that's particularly exciting, though, is that if we get the right policy, the right regulation, the right business models, we can hit this really important win that's out there. Now, the question is, is how do we go about doing it? And there are a ton of exciting developments and options and opportunities, but not much in the way of helping to stick this together in some form that helps a finance minister or helps a World Bank country officer or helps folk that potentially have the ability to unlock the finance that's required for this transformation that's in the, the national interest. Jamie. I think, could you put the slides up, if that's... Right, so you can, yep. I mean, sorry, James. Yeah. Yeah, confusing. Hello, yeah, thank you. Uh, so just to reflect on that, I think, uh, for those of you who joined session three, it was all about the sort of how the transition to electromobility across the global south might be in, in some ways problematic or have, have some difficulties attached. This is, is, is sort of about the, the, optimal, the, the optimism within these solutions and, and how, how we can make this work in practice. The reason why it's uh, focused on Asia and the Pacific is it because it communicates the findings of a think piece that brings together um, the, Asian Development, the, the, the Asian Development Bank um, with our CCG and FCDO colleagues of a workshop that we held. Um, last week, if this button would click, that was my, oh, there we go. Yeah, so the concept, as you can see, you've seen this diagram before if you attended session three, and it's really that transport electrification and, and renewable energy integration can have this really nice effect if you bring them both together. And this is, it provides this path from high carbon and or unreliable power systems towards low carbon and reliable power systems. And this is for two reasons. So firstly, electric vehicles, and this is including passenger cars, but also two, three wheelers, minibuses and buses 
can act as this incentive for would-be generator developers and grid infrastructure developers to go out and build more stuff, build more network, and that has the effect of increasing access to electricity if done well. Um, this has the effect of enabling payments to be ring-fenced, and it secures the de-risking of power system investments. And secondly, what's special about electric vehicle charging versus any other kind of electrical demand that we have known to date is that it's remarkably flexible. Vehicles aren't used a lot of the time, even if they're, they're kind of public vehicles, public transport vehicles. And therefore, this, this flexibility in, gen, in demand favors uh, variable renewable generation like wind and solar, which is now cheaper to build um, than, than coal and gas. So this discussion piece is, is um, part of a, a, a discussion piece we want to take forward to COP26 and beyond is about how we can make this work in practice and give practical solutions on the ground. Just one slide um, to, to bust some jargon um, on the difference between grid-connected and, and off-grid-connected solutions. So no matter what we're talking about across the board, we're talking about battery electric vehicles, so a vehicle, a motorbike, a car, a, a bus that, that relies on a battery to power its motion. Um, but where that vehicle gets its energy to fill up its battery um, depends on one of these two case studies. So grid connected refers to where a large synchronized national grid is doing the charging, the supply of that energy. And an off-grid case um, uh, refers to the case where it's either from a mini grid, a micro grid, or even a nano grid, or it's a standalone um, charging solution. In either way, though, it's battery electric vehicles we're focusing on this think piece. So this, as I said, comes out of this, this workshop. So as Mark alluded to, um, part of getting this right is bringing together these, these previously siloed uh, ways of thinking in, in transport and electricity and, and bringing them together in one room. So we, we got together with the ADB and colleagues from FCDO and our other colleagues from CCG across, across a wide uh, range of their secretariat. Um, and initially, we asked them to, to brainstorm what are the barriers to making this work, like what stands in the way of successful e-mobility and renewable energy integration. Firstly, it's all familiar. It's the upfront cost of EVs is just too high for both private and public transport operators who struggle to secure finance in a lot of these countries. Um, there's a lack of standardization in EV charging infrastructure, so in terms of payment, in terms of charging protocols, in terms of comms, in terms of all this stuff that, that really like stops, hinders um, certainty in, in, in would-be investors into this technology. There's unreliable power systems, particularly in small island developing states using the ADB's um, sort of nomenclature, um, which limits the appeal of e-mobility to would-be investors. Governments have limited resources, so you're constantly awash of, of um, say, electric vehicle, ve vehicle to grid trials going on in the UK, and because they have all this resource, that can, this can happily be done to find the correct solution before implementing on a wider scale. A lot of these countries do not have this kind of resource, so, so you don't have the, the ability to be able to find out which thing works best in, in your specific case study before implementation. Um, the monopolies of often state-owned power authorities um, often are very resistant to change. Um, and this, as I've said before, this kind of silos of operation is an enormous barrier. The fact that transport planners, electricity system operators, and climate financiers often sit in very different places I mean, it really uh, hinders, hinders the opportunity to talk across these sectors. There's often a lack of economies of scale, um, so particularly, again, in the small island developing states, um, to getting these solutions on the ground. Government subsidies for fossil fuels um, will, of course, make fossil fuel technologies artificially cheaper than electric mobility in, in a lot of cases. Um, and then there's also a lack of availability of renewables at a certain time, so a lot of places that might rely on solar insulation Obviously, you can't use that to charge the electric vehicles parked at night. So we then went forward with this framework of enablers to address those barriers specifically. And their apologies if this screen is too small, but um, they're split up into four categories, distinct categories. But that arrow going across them is, is meant to imply that they all have to be done in parallel rather than in series to address this issue. The one on the left we've called business models, but this is really about innovative solutions to enable the growth of e-mobility to go hand in hand with the growth of renewables. And then the other three are really about enabling that to happen. So the one on second from the left is the policy and regulation. So what strategies, what um, targets, what regulatory frameworks are needed in order to provide these 
these would-be investors, these, these um, would-be entrepreneurs and business model innovators um, to going and investing in this technology. The one next along, the green financing one. So this is about the financing mechanism that w should be used to provide consumers and this, these developers with access to better finance to overcome these barriers that we just discussed. And then the fourth one, I think, is um, really tying together those other two. So it's governance and coordination. It's coordinating finance. It's coordinating electricity and transport, making things speak together, breaking down barriers between silos and enabling um, certainty and, and, and uh, giving appeal um, in this transition. And this applies to both grid-connected and off-grid-connected charging. So just a little bit more focus. There's way too much to read on this slide. But just as a few kind of highlights, the business models were all about what EV charging can do for a power system, especially when you rapidly increase the share of renewables. So this is applicable all over the world, not just for um, low middle income countries, but this includes bi-directional charging, so vehicle to grid, as it's often called. And this has very different applications in, say, a small island developing nation to a, a large nation like, like the UK. Um, but it's the same sort of basic technology and the same sort of standardization. Um, in smaller, smaller states and, and mini-grid applications particularly, we could see vehicles being used for backup power and grid support when they're not being used. Um, and the frameworks for these business models, a lot of ideas are coming again for this kind of peer-to-peer -peer trading um, business models in, in the mini-grid setting and then utilizing these private-public partnerships um, to encourage growth in this sector. But behind this has to be a standardization of these business models in terms of the comms, in terms of the financing, in terms of paying for these systems. So maybe a bus operator could pay at a, a different mini grid from where they usually operate um, to allow certainty for these businesses to operate. And the second one is about policy and regulation. So as I said, this is about providing certainty for these solutions. And this is pretty simple stuff. So it's setting phase out dates for internal combustion engine vehicles. It's targeted support for renewable energy generators and it's most importantly, perhaps removing fossil fuel subsidies. Um, one of the most important things that we keep coming back to that seems to be an issue across the Asian Development Bank member countries is this siloed operation between transport and electricity sector. So bringing these silos together and integrating transport and electricity revenues into one project to increase the kind of financial attractivity of doing these things. Um, and then also, leveraging um, the financing to support sustainable production. So we've, we've, we've heard in the last session about um, the potentially negative impact of mining resources for the electromobility transition. We need to be using um, financial mechanisms to support sustainable production. Um, the third one is about enabling these green finance. So again, lots of things came out of this workshop, but just to dwell on a couple ones. Um, it's all about allowing you know, would-be consumers and potential generate, uh, infrastructure developers access to better returns. So this could be forming cooperatives to allow access to a bigger, to, to as I say, an economy of scale, or offering um, kind of concessional finance minimum revenue guarantees um, to enable uptake and these PPP funding arrangements. Also, we can explore the extent to see what we can steer what financing is used for, which again can go back to local and sustainable manufacturing. The final one, as I say, is about allowing those last two to facilitate uh, the feasibility of, of doing that first one. So this is allowing finance and policy to support innovation. And this can be setting targets that reach across all sectors and using best practice across regions without the resource to, to trial scenarios. So we mentioned that particularly small island developing states might not have resources to be able to trial a certain solution, but one that works in one might work in another. Again, we have to be mindful, of course, that there is no one size fits all. And then again, this keeps coming back in everything in the workshop, so it therefore must be important, is breaking down these silos between transport people and electricity people. And we can do practical things to, to, to do this rather than just saying these words. So this is about including mobility targets as part of electricity decarbonization policy and creating spaces for cross-section discussion. Um, and then I think, I uh, don't know how I'm doing for time, but this is uh, what we did in the next phase of this workshop where we brought everyone back into the room, the virtual room, of course, and asked them to bring their favorite enablers across all those different sectors. And then we asked them to rank them in terms of impact um, and effort. And enabled, what this enabled us to do is to sort of identify some nice kind of low hanging fruit, if you will, some low regret options to take forward into the next part of this um, series of, of, of think pieces 
and this, um, this discussion moving past COP26. So you can't read this, but this is all kind of taken from the slides before, um, and uh, we'll, we'll be able to publish, publish this information um, in due course. Um, I think just a case study, an interesting case study to, to bring, a, bring to light how this is already not only feasible, but, but favorable. Um, there is a, a, a company in, in Taipei um, called Gogoro who manufacture electric two-wheelers, so electric scooters, and rather than charging the vehicle directly, you have these battery swapping stations. So the, the photo on the top right um, shows a, a driver of one of these vehicles exchanging the battery. When those batteries are, I, when, you, when you trade your batteries, you, you go along and you put them back in the stack, and then there's always a, a load of them sat there. And this company have just signed, um, signed a deal with Thai Power, who are an electricity system operator, to, to provide bi-directional charging, i.e. vehicle to grid, with, with that electricity system operator for supporting that grid, which is, as we said, vitally important as we move to high renewables power mixes. And it also off offers an additional revenue stream for this e-two-wheeler manufacturer. Um, so really exciting stuff, and it's in its infancy. So this article from this picture was taken was the 26th of October, which was last Tuesday. You know, it's, it's really, really kind of in its infancy, but it's, it's great to see this, this being rolled out so quickly. Um, and just to mention here, you know, this company has expansion plans into, into China and India. The bottom right shows the electricity mix is still dominated by coal in, in both these countries. So these kind of technologies to both bring down the upfront cost of EVs, be it EV two-wheelers, um, and also provide, uh, uh, provide support to the electricity grid that particularly benefits from when it, from when it uh, increases its share of renewables is absolutely vital. So our next steps from, from, this, from this kind of think piece, this workshop, is to just highlight that there's enormous potential for these kind of really nice win-win solutions that Mark mentioned at the start that both decarbonize and improve access to both mobility and electricity. Um, and what we want to do is, is find the, the ways of doing this. So we've, we've, um, we've found this, we've, we've applied this framework of enablers that, that set these kind of four basic categories of things that must be done in parallel. Um, and then we've used this to, to take forward to low regret options. Um, we've demonstrated through case study that these innovations are not only feasible, but actually favorable. Um, and and these, um, yeah, these options need to be taken forward, basically. So the next one says, we, should, we recommend that these lower regret options should be further examined um, and basically turned into practical solutions on the ground. And that's the next step for this piece of work. Thank you, that's me. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mark. And thank you, James, for a very good overview of the workshop and the think piece that will be coming out from that. Before I turn to the panelists for their thoughts or feedback on, on the presentation, I just wanted to pick up on, on one thing you said. Clearly, there's a lot of challenges and it's not going to be easy, not least because of the silo. So it's great that we're looking at this transport energy nexus. But right at the beginning, James, you mentioned optimism. And I may be a little bit biased for the region I work in, Asia and the Pacific, particularly developing Asia. Um, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the future from a transport perspective of e-mobility. Uh, and as you rightly put in, I think the second slide, the, the, the difference between different types and you stressed all the types of e-vehicles that we're looking at. Transport in Asia, particularly Southeast and South Asia, is dominated by two wheelers, be that rural transport or urban transport. And the, the, the capital tipping point between CapEx and OpEx has already been reached in many countries in terms of the decision, what is the cheaper option over the life of that vehicle? Is it is it a, a, an e-vehicle or is it a combustion engine vehicle? So for the two, three wheelers, similarly, we were seeing uh, in some of the fleet vehicles, either local government units, buses, taxi fleets, the tipping point again is there primarily because the operating costs are such a larger part because the, the vehicles by their very nature are on the road for the vast majority of the day. So the capex, sorry, the operating cost becomes a more important part and providing that the power price is less or the fuel uh, gasoline price or diesel price is high, then the operating costs become much better as well. So I'm, and the final point on, on Asia's optimism is uh, 
a phrase I, well, not the, the, the phrase I stole from a from a, 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 a very insightful talk by uh, BMW, the auto, automobile company, but which referred to RIP, not in terms of rest in peace, but in terms of range, infrastructure and price. Quite often in Asia, the length of trips are considerably shorter than they are in the developed world. So the range of the vehicle is not so much of an issue. If we're talking charging of fleet vehicles or two, three wheelers, often they can be charged at home or at the depot. So again, compared to the four wheel vehicles, the infrastructure issue at the moment, given the fleet mix, uh, the vehicle mix, sorry, it may be less of an issue. And as already mentioned, that sort of tipping point in capital cost and operating costs for certain vehicle types in certain countries. So very optimistic on the transport side, but clearly this discussion is linking transport to energy. Um, we, we, we are very mindful that the grid factors, and as one of your other slides showed, those grid factors may not be the best. So yes, we can push for full uh, shift to e-vehicles, but if that is being, if that power is to, to, for the vehicles is being driven by heavily polluting fossil fuel, coal or, or, or others, uh, we need to look at the combination between how that grid is, it, it, or how the power is generated, uh, both in terms of the increased demand that may be given, but also in terms of the the energy sources as well. So, sorry, I, I took the the opportunity as chair to sort of give my thoughts on that. But if I could turn to the panelists, and I'd like to to sort of run along in terms of Pam first, um, and and then Michelle, uh, Monica, and Aman in that order, if I may. Do you want to share your thoughts on what has been presented? Um, whether you will have questions about it or whether you want to agree with it or whether you want to perhaps more inter interesting for such sessions to challenge some of the thoughts that were put forward as well. So over to you, Pam, first, please. Well, thank you very much, Jamie. And uh, uh, first of all, on behalf of um, ADB, I just wanted to express our thanks to the CCG team for inviting us to the roundtable discussions and the opportunity to contribute to this very important piece of work. Um, my fellow panelists will no doubt have, um, you know, lots of very good technical feedback to offer, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to also reflect a little bit, take a step back and reflect a little bit on the process that we, we, we went through together with the CCG. Um, I feel that this think piece is really very timely, particularly with all our collective aspirations to meet climate commitments, as you are aware, with Paris alignment. And this model that is being um, proposed um, doesn't just contribute to mitigation, it also enhances resilience through the V2G um, concepts, as well as adaptation. So it's really important because it's not just about, you know, e-mobility is about mitigation. It's not, it's also about strengthening resilience and adaptation. And I think that's a really important point. Um, and e-mobility, we feel, is one of the most efficient ways of decarbonizing transport without compromising on mobility. However, um, as you have, um, has also been discussed in several of the earlier sessions, the success of the e-mobility program really is contingent on a conducive enabling environment being put in place. And this included, includes you know, a wide range of factors that was, has been discussed, like JB mentioned, a uh, low carbon grid factor, um, availability of charging infrastructure, the competitiveness of EVs, as um, James pointed out, and what is the cost of switching? So it was a really great discussion that we had where we explored the different challenges in different developing country contexts. The other thing is oftentimes, um, and I've also reflected on this together with CCG team, um, the practical implementation, I find, lags behind research by a very long mile. So when we were approached by the CCG team for consultations to contribute to this think piece, um, we were really delighted because this offers us the opportunity to share the ground realities and the experiences to support research efforts that will be directed at developing practical and realistic solutions, particularly in addressing real-world problems. 
which can be more impactful. Um, of course, speaking from ADB, if these solutions can be implemented in the developing country context. So although these were really early stage dialogue, I mean, the discussions we had last week, as mentioned by James. So these dialogue between CCG and ADB, you know, it may take time to materialize these visions that we all share today. But I, I believe that the seed has been sown even with this initiation of the dialogue to even offer up some ideas for us, even in ADB, to pursue creative solutions with our client governments to deliver on the ambitious decarbonization targets. And it's really up to all of us to keep this topic live after COP26 to continue talking about it and to continue to support and collaborate for results. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pam. And I'm sure we will be trying our best to, to offer this support to all our clients as, as, as all the others on the panel. Please, may I turn to Michelle? Uh, do you have any thoughts uh, on what was presented? Over to you, Indeed. Michelle. Thank you. Um, so my name is Michelle Horsfield. I'm representing Sean Kidney uh, on behalf of the Climate Bonds Initiative. And, and I will not uh, comment on, on either electricity or, or the, the transport side. But what I can comment on is the finance side. Um, the key, I have two comments I want to make. One is about um, money is there. The other is about de-risking. And then I have a, a question for you, actually. Um, so the first thing I want to, to communicate in the room is very much that the money is there. Investors are falling over themselves to invest in green stuff. The demand that we have seen for bonds, they are always oversubscribed. Green bonds, even more so. The money is there. The second thing that I want to comment on is about de-risking, and it was as, uh, talked about a little bit, um, and to convey this idea about some of the barriers. And I think that is one of the, the key things so investors will invest, but they need to look at what the barriers are to de-risk. And, and that was the word that was mentioned earlier in the presentation. And I think that's quite key, articulating what those barriers are. And in, in order to get some sort of standard definitions, and that's very much what we're about at Climate Bonds, is putting in place standard definition for what good looks like. So my question for you really is whether you can comment on how to balance that urgency of climate change, the code red, against that need for dialogue across the silos because dialogue always takes time. So let me summarize again then. So firstly, the money is there. And secondly, we need to look at how to de-risk that, to identify the barriers um, and, and to, to look at those um, and by creating standard definitions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Michelle. Um, before we go to James, shall we just run through them all? Um, so if I may ask Monica, would you like to give us your thoughts or any comments you may have, please? Thank you, James, and thank you for the presentations and reflections from earlier speakers. Um, working at the Green Climate Fund, we do financing, of course, um, but I'm, I'm a bit more bold than the previous speaker. I say I'll talk about the transport and the energy sectors as well, <laughs> just, just briefly. No, because I, when listening to this, I was thinking I miss the... Um, the modal shift. We're talking about people shifting from uh, an auto engine, a car, to another car. But when you're a transport planner or, or a politician, you have to think about the logistics and the planning of the transport system. And not so many years back, it was all about shifting to public transport because that was the most environmental solution. And uh, again, not so many years back, or still, I. I often still read and see statements that say we need to have a dense urban form because that's the most sustainable. But when you talk about e-mobility and decentralized charging, that might not be true. You might actually have a decentralized mobile charging system that enables you to have a perfectly sustainable, I mean, environmentally sustainable, 
transport system that actually does not have to be a dense urban form. So I'm probing you to think a little bit broader, padding shifting about what is it that we're transporting and uh, between what nodes are we transporting things, not just shifting the car type. Because, um, so yeah, that's my reflection. I mean, I, I agree very much with the opportunities that you present about the e-mobility and the grid opportunity. Um, but if you look from a logistics pers pers perspective on the transport sector, you have everything, but you have everything there. You have trade, you have the marine uh, e-mobility, e uh, and so many other aspects that uh, I think you, you should weigh into the optimization of this. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's my uh, reflections. But being from the Green Climate Fund, and you mentioned the difficulty to find financing for two different sectors, we would probably be a good uh, a good target because we do finance both sectors and, and we do try to work on country perspectives so our intention is to work with um, you know integrated solution long term planning solutions then we as well of course have the weakness that we need to boil down to projects at some point. And projects are projects, and they're born by someone who is maybe looking for five or maximum 10 years uh, work in, in a sector that they know well. And you might be very good at transport, or you might be very good at, 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 at uh, electricity grids. But we really do try to tell the countries that if you can, if you can politically uh drive the drive the planning towards a coordinated planning including land use transport energy supply water supply we are all for it please do include adaptation also thank you very much monica um a very important message on the need or the complexity and therefore the need to look at a whole range of different options to address the decarbonization of transport plus um, the green or the, the renewable approach for that energy generation. And I'd just like to, to mention it, excellent that Michelle said the money is there. That's great to hear. And also, uh, Monica, in terms of that combination between breaking down these silos and financing for both transport and energy as a combined solution so very heartening we we're meant to be looking at the finance in this section so it's good to hear that a the money is there and b that we're not looking within our silos at the, at the how that money should be allocated uh aman if i could turn to you uh what are your thoughts uh, on the presentation that was provided thank you thank you thank you so much for having me here um really interesting discussion so far and uh, thanks uh, jamie for uh, chairing the session um, three specific points. One is on the topic of, um, you know, how EVs could serve as an anchor load for renewables. Do want to talk a little more about the barriers um, in making this happen. And then lastly, I want to talk about B2G and B1G. Um, on the first point on anchor loads, um, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly in agreement with what's been shared so far that, you know, um, electric mobility and EVs in general can serve as an anchor load, which can de-risk renewable energy projects uh, by providing, um, you know, a stable, guaranteed um, load um, and, and, and mit mitigate the off-taker risk. Uh, but this requires aggregation of charging demand. This requires predictable or at least uh, manageable demand, um, which takes you down a couple of paths. One is that you need to be able to work with fleets because private customers of EVs are often unpredictable in their charging behavior, or at least you can't necessarily tell them when to charge and when not to charge. Uh, with, with fleets, it's much more easy uh, to, to manage their charging behavior because uh, thinking and decision-making is a lot more based on uh, economics the second aspect of this is around data sharing and the need for collaboration. Um, oftentimes, you know, when, when we're trying to aggregate and, and manage charging demand, you, you 
have the technology to do it, but there's the data layer of it, which is often missing from the picture, especially in many countries in the global south. Um, this requires significant collaboration between uh, discoms, between charging operators, between fleets, um, and of course, renewable energy projects. Uh, but then you're also thinking about, you know, uh, other aspects of data sharing, specifically as they relate to the data communications infrastructure, with, as you're thinking about governance of data, you know, um, privacy of data, cybersecurity. And privacy doesn't necessarily only relate to a customer's privacy, but also a corporation's privacy. You know, they don't necessarily want to share their data, which can, in effect, um, undercut their own business model and their own competitive advantage in the market. The second thing that I would talk about is the barriers that, that, that you all listed and completely in agreement with all of those. I'd just like to add a few others. One is around the lack of uh, meet metering infrastructure um, and uh, data sharing infrastructure, um, which, which may prevent some of these uh, business models and innovative solutions to take place. The second is around structural inefficiencies in utilities themselves. Um, so many of these utilities, you know, especially in, in the global south, um, you know, suffer from, from legacy uh, um, constraints around how they're governed, how they're financed. Um, so need to be able to work with those utilities and, and really resolve those issues before you go forward. And then the last thing is um, the market structure itself. So again, providing that anchor load requires aggregation of demand, but can aggregators really work in the market that you're creating or, or that, that you're trying to work, work in? So that may also require some market reforms um, that may or may not uh, exist. And then the last thing that I want to pick on is around V2G. So yes, absolutely. It's an amazing uh, technology with immense potential when you're talking about frequency response, when you're talking about arbitrage, but let's not forget about the potential that EVs have just in terms of we be one G, which is just the ability to charge or not charge and where to charge. Um, you know, there's, there's ample work that has been done already, which says that, you know, just preventing curtailment of renewable energy resources um, by charging when you want the EVs to charge is twice as valuable. Um, compared to all the value of V2G services put together. Um, so just want to think a little bit about that and also think about, you know, um, the infrastructure upgrades, the metering uh, infrastructure, the metering uh, requirements that go along with enabling V2G. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aman, and a, a hugely important area again. Uh, my, my bias is on the transport side, but data, I think, is is a lot of transport planning is 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 in the dark. We're not really sure where people want to get to. Logistics may be better, the freight side, but passenger movements um, very unusual. And decision makers, uh, I think, was mentioned earlier. Into if we're seeing such rapid urbanisation in the developing. Uh, economies, how is an urban planner or a transport system manager? in one of those cities that's seeing such rapid expansion, how are they meant to try and really implement that? We real, we need to shift our mindset in terms of the data, how that's utilized both for the, the, the end users, whether they be freight or passengers, and, and for the decision makers and the operators as well. So I think that data component is really useful uh, too. I just wanted to remind everybody in the audience that we're still uh, collecting questions. So if you want to go onto the Slido, uh, please, please do so and put up um, your, your questions there. Uh, I'd like to sort of shift shift uh, shift a little bit here and, and look at some real world examples and we'll have another presentation. Uh, Rema Redzai um, from the Electric Drive Africa will give a presentation on lessons learned from financing the expansion of solar microgrids for e-mobility. Uh, uh, and, and this is in the African context. Rema Redzai, please go ahead and give your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you for sharing. Uh, thank you to the CCG for having me here. So uh, it's an interesting topic. I think this is quite um, uh, critical that we focus on this integration of uh, the transport side and the energy side. As you remember, the current status quo as before, uh, these two were siloed, as everybody said, but it was worse in the fossil fuel industry because 
uh, there were players who were working in the mobility side, who were independent from players who were working in the energy side, the fuel companies. But now there's an opportunity now of a link of interlinking these two fields uh, on the energies, on the electricity side and the mobility side. So uh, on the cover page of my presentation, this is an example of a beautiful mall in South Africa. This is the Mall of Africa. It is uh, almost a five megawatt plant. And I put this here because I want to give examples of what we have learned from the commercial and industrial solar sector. So I'm gonna focus on two sectors, which I think are more critical to advance electric mobility and also renewables, the commercial and industrial sector and also the off-grid rural sector. So I'm gonna focus on those two areas. So if you look at uh, the um, this commercial industrial sector in Africa, I've given two examples here, uh, and the growth in South Africa on the bottom left and the growth in Kenya. Similar growth, but albeit to a different magnitude. At the beginning, if you look, this is about 2013, uh, about uh, eight years ago, there wasn't much uh, commercial and industrial solar penetration in South Africa. Same thing in Kenya. That was because uh, back then the price per watt of solar panels was still quite high and there wasn't access to that much financing. So people were making direct investments, uh, be it, uh, mostly uh, farmers and shopping malls and some factories. And then as the price per watt went down, as you know, it's gone down over 90% over the past 10 years, it was now in the area whereby it was quite feasible to try and finance some of these things with uh, long-term uh, corporate PPAs or corporate uh, lease agreements. So that's when you started to see some sort of um, uh, growth in the sector as well. Uh, and also there was quite a bit of education needed back uh, for both on the customer side, people didn't understand how solar could work for them in the commercial industrial sector. And also on the banking side, the banks probably didn't have the technical skills to really understand the uh, commercial industrial solar. So for them, they first also had to understand how it works and have comfort in it be it or you are putting this asset over 15 years, uh, the warranties, the operation and maintenance, how would that all work? Uh, they needed comfort to be able to finance this. So as that all grew, we saw a uh, growth in the sector. So right now, as of 2020 in South Africa, there is just over 1000 megawatts of rooftop solar in the commercial industrial space, which is uh, quite a, a significant number. And if you know, in, in, in South Africa right now, in other countries as well, like Zimbabwe and Zambia, they have some grid constraints that tend to lead to power rationing, which we call load shedding. And in South Africa, for example, they, depending on how much they need to ration at the time, they split that into stages. So ESCOM has stage one to stage eight. So stage one means they need to shed off 1000 megawatts. So if you look at that number, it's quite significant. Over the past seven years, we have managed to add 1,000 megawatts of rooftop solar, which is equivalent to the quantum they need to shed for to to switch off the power if they if the grid is strained by about 2,000 megawatts or so. So rooftop solar can then contribute significantly uh, to this space. Same thing in Kenya now, where we are seeing that we have now got about uh, 50 megawatts of rooftop solar installed. Also, the same thing. Initially, it was mostly uh, uh, direct investments from the consumers themselves. And then there was growth from uh, DFIs and also some local banks started bringing in loans. But now with people got comfort, we're now seeing growth as well in the corporate PPAs where people feel they don't need to own the asset, but then they can uh, then pay for the kilowatt hours or they can pay a monthly lease, a fixed monthly lease with some escalations per year over 15 years. And if you work out the cost per kilowatt hour, it also went down as the cost per watt went down to install these plants. Like for example, in Kenya, the average grid cost is 20 cents per kilowatt hour. Initially, if you were doing a 15 year PPA, you probably would, were looking at uh, paying about 18 cents per kilowatt hour. That was maybe about six, seven years ago. But right down, right now, as the cost per watt has gone down, a corporate PPA will come in probably at about 10 cents per kilowatt hour. So people are then saying, listen, I can then save 10 cents per kilowatt hour for a uh, grid tight solution through the day, and I can offset the high, past, the, the high cost of my utility grid. So now this is where we also need some, 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 some work and help in the regulation. In most of these markets, there aren't any feed in policies or you can't do net metering, you can't feed back to the grid. And you can also play in some sort of market where you can, there is no wheeling framework, whereby if you have free real estate, you can 
load uh, some megawatts on your roof or on the ground and then find another off taker in another uh, in another area and then wheel that power using the uh, utilities transmission grid to that site and have your 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 own back to back agreement that framework is quite critical and needed now uh, it will help advance both uh, electric vehicles and also renewable energy adoption to meet the energy deficit. Now, this is an example of a power plant. It's about 370 kilowatt. It's in Johannesburg. So on, on the left here, you see this is a weekday. You can see the nice blue blue curve is the solar production during the day. Uh, the red is the demand of the building. So you can see uh, all of this is being absorbed during the day by the factory. But now when you go to the weekend, because uh, they switch off the systems, everybody goes home for the weekend. On the right, the load now drops from about 400 kilowatt to about 30 kilowatt. So what happens, because you cannot feed in, there is excessive curtailment on the weekend. So now you can, you only, so your power plant, which is uh, able to produce 400 kilowatt, is only then curtailed and constrained to about 30 kilowatt. So now that if you are now having a lease agreement, where you're paying a fixed monthly system, or even if you've bought the system outright, now you you then aren't able to enjoy all that power on the weekend but now if you then these are commercial players they probably have fleets so now if you then have a fleet and convert part of that fleet to electric depending on your use cycle then you can then unlock more value by then charging at these times where there's curtailment and then that brings down your cost of charging and also unlocks more value from your existing solar plant and also if people now want to add more solar plants in the future you can now bundle the two together and say, listen, we put charging infrastructure when we put uh, the, 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 the solar plant. And also we help you understand how you can have uh, your charging cycles and unlock value from both your electric vehicles and your solar plants. So now this is the commercial industrial sector. If so, so oh, let me just go back. So now I want to look at another critical area, the off-grid rural sector. So mini grids have been driven mostly by donors, whether they are religious organizations or DFIs. Uh, but so for us to really drive adoption and increase access to electricity, we need these mini grids to be commercially viable. But as is right now, they aren't really commercially viable because of uh, utilization. If you look at most mini grids, this was a study done by the Af Africa Mini Grid Development Association. And they found that the average revenue per user is about anywhere between three dollars to about five dollars whereas the operational cost to operate that plant per user is about three dollars to six dollars so already it doesn't give a very enticing picture for an independent player to come and roll out mini grids in the rural areas but now if we try and improve the economics by improving consumption by bundling in these mini grids with electric mobility we then improve consumption and we then improve viability and then private players who've led the development in the commercial industrial sector in the urban areas can also attract financing that, uh, and also get some returns to then spread these mini grids in the, develop, in the rural areas and we expand the grid. That's how we can stimulate the two together. So you can see this is a perfect mix, perfect mix, which is why I call it a match made in heaven. This will unlock private players to then contribute and uh, expand on the grid. And then uh, uh, I also spoke about uh, regulation. So this is a plant in Zimbabwe where net metering is allowed, where you can feed in. This is an example of a weekend where the load drops from about 120 kilowatts to about 40 kilowatts. Now, during this time, uh, this plant can fit into the grid. But what happens if, for example, if this excess energy can then be able to feed an EV fleet, or if the fleet is doing its round during the day, this energy can go in the grid and then during the night when the fleet is back, they can draw down from some of this energy that they can, we can say they have banked with the grid and get more advantage because at night time, maybe there might be a time of huge tariff, whereas they fed in this, this energy at a higher tariff during the day, then they can draw down and charge uh, during the night at a lower tariff when their fleet comes back to charge at night. So I think uh, the other thing to note is the growth and the... Um, in the renewables in the urban side has been driven mostly unsubsidized. It's been driven by the unit economics, as I explained earlier for Kenya. It's cheaper for you to offset the uh, daytime during solar. So uh, we need to then look at how then can we have new models that unlock uh, 
to unlock maybe a total cost of ownership for EVs. Because right now we aren't yet at some vehicles that are, are at price parity with the current ICE fleet. But uh, if you take a leaf uh, from the from England and maybe in France where they had the Nissan Leafs and the Renault Zoe's and the Renault trucks before, they had what they call, uh, you would buy the car, but then you would lease the battery. Some sort of hybrid system like that could work here, whereby you could then go to a fleet operator, listen, I'm going to sell you this van, but I'm going to lease you the, 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 the battery. And then I'm going to also bundle in an energy plan where I also manage the charging. Then that will also drop the uh, operational costs and makes it enticing for the fleet operators. Because I think to get uh, volumes, uh, we need the fleet operators to really take uh, this forward. And also in the rural areas, because remember, in the rural areas currently, there is no inclusion. Uh, in Africa right now, the levels of motorization are quite low. Uh, in most countries, uh, just to give you an example, I think, I think in America, you have about 850 cars per 1,000 people. Whereas in most African countries, you have that number less than 50. 50 cars per 1,000 people. But those cars are mostly in the urban centers. So the rural sectors are underserved both, both on the energy side and also on the transport side, which would then speak into uh, sort of like they're constrained economically. They can't get their goods to the market. They can't access healthcare on time. And so now when you then bundle the two together, it's, there is no business case for a fossil fuel player to go to the village and put a huge forecourt and sell diesel. There are just no vehicles for them there, just from a business case. But it makes sense for a developer now to put a mini grid in that village and then beat a 20 kilowatt or 30 kilowatt mini grid and then use that energy to power a clinic, to power a school, but also charge a two kilowatt battery from a two wheeler, from a three wheeler. And then that two wheeler is then becomes part of that business ecosystem. So this is how the, the, the way we are now looking at energy and transport together is actually going to uh, drive inclusion and also improve the economics, uh, the economy as well in the rural areas. Yeah, so thank you. That was just a summary of some practical examples of what we're seeing in the rural areas on the mini grid side and also in the urban areas on the commercial industrial side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ramaredzai. Uh, some very positive examples, and again, your positivity was showing through. You, you really are obsessed and, and, and a leading light Thank in you. this. That, that innovative finance and the, that sort of fleet operators, do you own the vehicle? Do you lease the vehicle? Do you own the battery or lease the battery? Is it swapping? I think we, uh, at the Asian Development Bank, we, we, we provide a lot of support for urban transport and looking at e-buses. Th those, those, those decisions really are quite critical in terms of the viability and the willingness of the uptake for the operators to, to get involved, um, so do the vehicles and the, and the power supply as well. So some really good examples, both learning from large industry as well as off-grid, uh, that rural examples you mentioned as well. So thank you very much for that, Ramredzai. If I can now turn to the panelists, uh, we, we've got a, a number of questions coming in, but I have some questions I'd also like to put to the panelists. But given that we have about 30 minutes now for the Q&A session, let's try and, if possible, keep uh, response is short so we can get to some of the audience questions as well and if you are in the audience please keep those coming in there's there's some excellent questions coming uh, that, that are appearing but first Monica if I could uh, go I'll put a question to you and it's picking up on something that was said in the first presentation about how we cut across the sectors and the various stakeholders who are involved I believe you're doing some work in South America uh, and are there any lessons that you could share with us on the approach and stakeholder involvement and how you brought all of the various players to the table to be able to move that particular project forward in, 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 in Latin America or any other examples you may have on stakeholder involvement. Over to you, please, Monica. Well, thank you. Um, are you referring to, uh, we as a climate fund, we have this readiness support, which I think is very instrumental and countries use it uh, differently, but uh, it can be used to, to prepare a sector to transform. And in this particular case, we are supporting readiness to 14 uh, Latin American countries to work on e-mobility because um, it takes some time and some effort bef before you have this investment case and before you have the uh, sort of bankable uh, 
large scale bankable at least investments in 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 transport sector or in the shift to an e mobile uh, transport sector and uh, and this is a weakness many times because invest investors want to invest in in uh, in uh, bankable projects and uh, there's sort of a, often i think a planning gap so uh, I, 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 it would be too early to say I have experience because they have barely started, but um, uh, from from that particular project. But I, I know from from I mean the very many years I've been working, and I'm so happy to hear the inspiration from Rami Reita. But um, I, I have seen so many times that it takes time. I would say take 15, 50, 20 years before something changes if you want to do a shift between different sectors. Uh, and I mean, that like, maybe it's uh, depressing, but uh, it's better to face that and start working on that. Because if you want, it's not so long, in 15, 20 years, if you just take a decision to change, uh, you can make it in that time time frame, but it's not a project thing. It's a much more long term planning thing, and uh, so I'm proud to be part of preparing or, or offering this readiness uh, support. I think that's important. But I just wanted to take the opportunity also to 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 really uh, commend Ramiretta and and just assure you that uh, the kind of Parting shifting investments that we're looking for from Green Climate Fund include exactly this kind of combination of different demand in, for example, rural areas. And I would add to your presentation, I would add also um, domestic, uh, simple domestic dwellings and houses and, and the logistics around it. There's such an opportunity to just look at the demand side for, for energy, uh, you know, uh, including transport, it would be much more viable. So, sorry. Thank, thank you very much, Monica. Um, some good thoughts there. Um, Michelle, if I may turn to you now, and I wanted to go back to your your statement earlier that the money is there. If I could just push you a little bit on that, if it's not too cheeky, because um, it's quite clear, I think, that we do need more investments and we need innovative forms of investments. So two sort of questions here. What Could you describe a little bit what that investment might look like and also where does it come from? And I'm, I, by that, I mean the public, private or other financial sources. So y y you were very brave to say that the money is there. So I wanted to push you a little bit and say, well, w what does that money look like and how will it be delivered to this energy transport nexus? Thank you. Well, heap of questions in there. Um, but let me just um, follow up on, on some of the, the things there. So I think the money is there. What we are seeing in the bond market um, is very much that we've got a trillion dollars a year in sight, probably end of next year, maybe early 2023. Um, and I think that is quite key because the UN have said so often that you know between five and seven trillion is what is needed. Um, so I think that's in sight. It's come largely from institutional investors. Many of these are our pension funds, asset owners, asset managers, um, who have got a changing mandate. In the past, it was just maximum returns. And what you're seeing now is this shift, people saying, my money matters and I want to make my money matter. And to do that, you know, you as my um, investor, I want to know where you're investing my money. Um, and it shifts so that we're seeing that they have this new sort of what it's called in the, in the finance industry, ESG mandate, environmental and social governance mandate. Um, and they have to find other ways to invest. One of the key things that, that climate bonds are, are keen to support and, and, and a large part of our work with governments is in sovereign issuance. And we're really keen to see the doubling of sovereign issuance. And by that, I mean a whole country. Um, so I live here in the UK. The, the British government um, announced, uh, well, they issued uh, a green bond uh, a few weeks back. Um, and there's about 13 countries around the world who have done it. Um, there's a report on our website if you're interested. Um, but for a country to issue a green bond um, it is a 
fabulous opportunity. Now, what I would say about the emerging markets, um, I was at an event last night, actually, just down the road from here, um, the launch of the Green Guarantee Company. Now, what this was about is about putting in place the guarantees that investors need in order to invest in some of this, you know, what they consider to be pretty risky, emerging markets kind of stuff. And that's important. And it comes to the question that I asked uh, about this tension. We need the definition, but actually we've got that tension between the urgency of climate change against the, the historical um, ways of doing business. And, and the finance business needs guarantees in place. They need the insurance. They need the reinsurance to be in place. And, and I think that's what we're seeing. But of course, in the past, insurers would never have talked to the financiers. And, and that's the bit about this dialogue that we need um, across the silos. Hope that helps. Uh, Michelle, excellent. Thank you very much. And we've got some questions in, in the Q&A that are similar thing in terms of the de-risking or the understanding of the finance, but a very different scale. And I hope I can get to that when we go through the Q&A session. Uh, Pam, can I please move to you now and ask you, you were involved with the workshop that was presented at the at the initial part of this session. What do you see were the greatest, sorry, the greatest barriers uh, to various stakeholder groups, and how do you think these could be overcome? Over to you, please, Pam. It's looking at the the barriers to the very integration of the various stakeholder groups. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jamie. Um, in fact, there are so many stakeholders. You know, like um, they're from the 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 people who are producing the EVs, you know, the supply, the whole supply chain. But maybe to simplify it for a um, brief discussion here, I think first let's look at the transport user groups. Um, and if we just focus on the road-based EVs in this, uh, in this context for the developing countries, the potential groups are informal transport operators, as we saw in Ramirez's um, presentation mm -hmm. as well, and they may operate two and three wheelers. Um, there could be taxis, private vehicles, freight trucks, and um, public buses, etc. And the second thing we need to look at is the key stages in the purchase of the EVs, the operations, as well as the maintenance. So thinking about the switching costs, that contributes a big part of the purchasing decision. And we talked about you know, the, the cost being one of the big barriers. So for two and three wheelers in informal public transport operators, and we know there are so many in South Asia context and the Southeast Asia context, do they need to abandon their vehicles or, or but how will they afford the new electric two and three wheelers? I mean, I mean, at this stage, most probably they're going to be more costly than the ICE, um, the fossil fuel powered equivalent. Or how practical is it and, um, and, and how much would it cost to retrofit with the new engines? So at a minimum, a cost neutral scenario, I feel, would be more realistic to influence a switch. And the factors contributing will be, you know, cost of the various types of equipment, policy support. And this could be a package of, for example, um, disincentives for fossil fuel vehicles or subsidies for EVs, etc., etc. So it needs to be a whole range of policy levers. And then we turn to operations looking at the availability and the convenience of the charging points and the range issues that we have also discussed like four wheelers private vehicles so if i was a if i own a private vehicle ev right overnight charging might be all right because my vehicle may be less in use in the night and um, and charging point is just in in the residential development but for public transport um like buses and taxis fast chargers would be needed right because time is money and what about trucks like the long distance you know freight trucks are there charging points along the intercity highways for long distance travel um and then how do we future proof our roads to realize aspirations of green logistics so okay so so it's like we have these um electric trucks or, or hydrogen trucks or or things like that. 
but the road needs to be designed such that there must be charging points there and then but if you need a charging point there you need a grid system there so in remote areas where the where the intercity highways are passing through is there a grid system so that kind of begs the question of the real underlying need for transport and energy nexus solutions the downstream um, challenges are really becoming apparent as we start to dig down into the layers. So a systems approach is definitely required um, in transport energy nexus solutions. And the final point is on maintenance, the availability of financing, technical support and parts. Um, and this may not be such a big problem in um, developed countries, but in, let's say, for example, remote islands in the Pacific region. Um, you know, it's actually expensive to even travel to these countries, right? And shipping and all that, everything is expensive and not to forget the very low economies of scale. So what support is there for maintenance? So yes, okay, we can buy the EVs. Um, in, in, in these um, remote uh, island countries. But what about maintenance? And does the battery need replacing, uh, maintenance for the vehicles, and the cost and frequency of the maintenance and replacement of the parts? And these are all significant segments of for the informal transport operators. How can we structure support to ensure self-sustainability in the long term? So um, this final point is, has been mentioned before, but I think it's just really important. There is no one standard, one size fits all policy mix that can be applied uniformly across the countries because every country is unique. Policy reforms need to be developed, taking into consideration the differentiated and specific needs of each country to ensure fit for purpose and also crucially to enable a just transition um, by the developing member countries. I stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pam. Aman, if I could turn to you, please. And I've got a question on what do you see as the key benefits on the integration between e-mobility and renewables? And link to that, so it's what, what, what are the benefits, but what business models? So addressing both of those points. Uh, over to you, please, Aman. And apologies, I, I put you last in both rounds. Apologies for that. But please, please, Aman, your response. No worries at all. I mean, I think uh, it just allows me to kind of listen into what others have to say and just, just makes my job easier here. Um, so I think, uh, um, Ramirez, I already uh, talked about some of these uh, benefits and, you know, I talked about how EVs and renewable energy um, are essentially a match made in heaven. Um, the way I like to think about electric vehicles is that they're not really batteries, sorry, they're not really cars or, or scooters with batteries, but instead batteries on wheels. Um, what you have are intelligent, interactive um, sources of electricity demand that is movable in um, time and space. Now, if you can aggregate and manage that charging, um, you can provide numerous uh, you know, grid services. Um, that that help uh, towards renewable energy integration, uh, both at the wholesale, but also at the uh, distribution system level. Um, shaping and controlling some of this EV charging can um, enable trader integration um, without necessarily needing new uh, natural gas generation for um, dispatchable capacity. Um, and also, of course, reducing the curtailment of renewable energy. Um, with that, there are several new business models that are emerging. Um, and I'd like to uh, build on what Michelle said earlier in terms of how some of these new conversations are starting to happen in, in the market. And many businesses, many companies are no longer trying to bring products as their you know, own uh, on by by the by themselves in in the market, but instead, you know, their go to market strategies often rely on partnerships and collaborations with uh, uh, multiple other entities. Um, so, if you can aggregate EV charging demand, you can essentially reduce the off taker and price risk uh, for uh, uh, new renewable energy projects. Um, I talked a little bit about uh, how utilities in the global south. Um, suffer from structural inefficiencies um, that can increase this risk um, and also increase the cost of capital 
um, associated with new renewable energy projects. Um, if you can, of course, get fleets uh, um, together and, and try to kind of uh, manage that demand, um, you can create these anchor loads that can that can uh, reduce this risk. Now, EV aggregators can also provide a demand response resource um, if they're allowed to participate in the wholesale market, which again is a whole new way in which some of that value that EVs provide can be realized. Um, going down the line, you'll see as electricity market markets evolve and, and uh, develop further, um, new types of services can be extracted from EV charging management um, and thinking about, you know, arbitrage or uh, load shifting, where essentially you can um, shift load from uh, peak times or at times when um, the, the real-time emissions factor off the grid is pretty high to times when um, the prices are lower or uh, the grid emissions factor is also lower. You can think about new types of services in terms of frequency regulation or peak shaving um, or, or um, you know, aggregated EVs could essentially also offer um, ramping or uh, spinning reserves. So again, these, these are some of the new models that are coming in, uh, but, but underlying all of these different business models is a robust data sharing infrastructure. Uh, which, in my opinion, needs to be established, and that will require some, some serious thinking on part of uh, um, corporate entities, but also governments and regulators. Thank you very much, Amen. Before we, 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 we are running short of time, but so before we move to, to Nancy, um, we, I'd like to just put in a couple of questions that we've received from the audience. But if I could put these to the panelists or to any others, uh, the presenters as well, if you have a response to these, please try and keep your response as short as possible. There's been a lot of questions on risk and risk at various scales um, in terms of the financing. I'm, I'm trying to combine a few questions here. One was access to and cost of money is quite different in the global north and the global south. And, and putting it, John Hine raised a point on a real specific example here. How could we finance the motorcycles or the tuk-tuk drivers or the small two, three wheelers when quite often they don't have a license, they don't have an address, they certainly would not have a bank account. So that sort of microfinance that risk associated yes we can look at large-scale investors but that how do we make that connection between that large-scale investments in what we've seen is a very promising area this transport energy nexus but at the end of the day that the funds would flow down to an individual who may be seen as a great risk because they don't have a bank account they don't have um, an address in that informal paratransit that is so prevalent across many developing cities. Uh, it, I, again, quite a broad question, but just putting it to anyone who I see there. Uh, Mark, your hand is up, please. If, if, I could, if I could have a quick go. Actually, I think moving the risk down to the informal sector makes this a whole lot more bankable than we could imagine. So, uh, and, and what I want to put forward is just that, you know, we've spoken a little bit about all of the complexities. We've got to move across sectors, uh, energy transport, we've got to talk to the finance people, we've got to come up with a language that we understand, but there's urgency, right? Um, at the same time, there are solutions that pop up to the top um, that are really simple, that can be aggregated and invested in very quickly, and they do all of this de-risking. So the first one, which speaks to the question about, well, how do, you, how do you cope with the informal sector? I can think of two examples right now, and I'll try it. Forgive me for simplifying uh, this if you're an engineer in this space, and forgive me for butchering the finance side of things if you're a finance person in this space. But point is, is that let's just take that example that we saw earlier on of the battery swap thing with, uh, with the scooters in, um, uh, in Asia early, earlier on. The cool thing about buying a motorbike without the battery is that the cost of that motorbike or three-wheeler becomes almost the same as the cost of an ICE, right? So however you get that finance as a tuk-tuk driver or informal butter butter driver or whatever the case is, you've now got the same cost to pay, all right? So that makes it possible to put that financial stuff in one space. Sorry, stuff. I guess there's a better <laughs> word for that. 
Um, <laughs> at the same time, you've got this you got this big battery bank, right? Now you can charge your informal person the same as in almost the same way as you would charge them for petrol. These can be small uh, chunks of money, so it can fit into the the business constraints that we have there. But this battery bank is special, as was mentioned the other. Uh, just earlier on, because if you step over into the electricity side of the world, it's the case that if you know there will be a demand for electricity, and if you know that electricity will be paid for at a particular price, and you can ring fence that, all of a sudden that investment is massively de-risked. I mean, astronomically de-risked. Okay, and for sure we have to be careful to make sure that the that there's the regulation and other systems in place to allow this particular little setup to um, fit into the system. But once it's there, that unlocks millions of vehicles and gigawatts worth of electricity investment, and it's all de-risked, right? This is the kind of thing that people could go in and invest in. And, you know, there, there are lots of examples. Another one on the informal side, the minibus taxi sector in South Africa. I have a friend who puts together the National Integrated Resource Plan for the country, and he says it's incredible. In the day, they don't have enough electricity. South Africa is this new shining light for renewables investments, which is wonderful, but at night, they've got, at 3 o'clock in the morning, when the wind turbines are pumping, they've got too much electricity and they have to curtail it, right? If you make available and there are there are there are there are ways of doing this with a total cost of let's, let's, let's put this in another way around we, we have to do some work on the financing of the the minibus taxis and so on but all of a sudden if you can say basically you have free fuel three o'clock in the morning if you can fit these other things together believe me informal business mm -hmm. will will move <laughs> and very 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 fast and again, you know, these, these are two examples that exist in, uh, that, that could be scaled very, very quickly. They provide safe investments for the renewable sector. Again, uh, in the South African case, you actually don't have to change too much when it comes to regulations and time of use pricing, and that's it. Okay? In, the, in the other case, there are some things you've got to look at about the way you're allowed to resell electricity or batteries or other things. But once that's done, you've de-risked two investments Massively, and to give you an example, this can reduce the final cost of um, the, the, the the levelized cost of electricity that's produced just because of the the reduction in the the capital risk, something like three or four times. Right, this is huge, and it can be scaled really, really quickly. So I just want to say, yes, there's a complexity. We've got to involve people, blah 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 blah, but it's also the case that there are potential sets of solutions that are really quite simple and can be moved on. We have to be careful, right? Because you don't want to lock into something that creates a, a, a problem. But the point is, is that there are solutions there that are promising that can unlock a large amount of investment really fast. Right. Thanks, Mark. I, I just wanted to read one more question. But if, if you do respond, I'm going to have to cut you off in a minute because we do need to get to Nancy for her closing thoughts on this. But the question I thought was very relevant for this topic, and it's from Simon Trace. Mini grids often struggle to achieve load factors high enough to make them financially viable. And I think this is where the crux of this discussion and this session is. Are there any examples of where electric vehicles would help to bridge that financial viability gap for mini grids? If anyone has an example that they would like to share uh, on that, but I think that's the crux. How can we look at these e-vehicles to offset some of that viability? in the renewable energy market as well. If nobody wants to answer, just to say, that, again, <laughs> this is absolutely obvious. All right, if you're allowed to sell the electricity with a willing buyer, willing payer price that's set, that price, which right now is super low, will just be sucked up by anybody who doesn't want to pay for petrol. Okay, thanks, Mark. I think we'd better move to Nancy uh, to give us some closing thoughts uh, on this as well. Uh, Nancy, you've waited very patiently. Please give us your thoughts on this uh, transport energy nexus. Over to you, please, Nancy. Yes, thank you, Jamie. I waited patiently, but I listened very carefully. And indeed, this was a very rich uh, and fantastic discussion. I learned quite a bit. Um, a lot of ideas put together by presenters and panels on how to leverage uh, this transport energy nexus. And I think that 
if there is one thing that clearly comes out of this discussion is an agreement that this is the next frontier uh, for all of us to engage into development banks, uh, researcher to really make that nexus work and deliver. Um, so I will not summarize the discussion, but I would like to highlight two uh, ideas that came out from uh, very strongly from this discussion. One is around this idea of, of projects, design and planning of project, and the, the other on financing. So on the project side, I think it's, we have now the evidence that indeed we need to think renewable and decarbonization of transport. The previous session made that case very clearly. Which one to start first is tricky, but really thinking integrated is the way forward. Um, I think we have made major headway over the past few years uh, from the conceptual point of view. We still have to translate those ideas into practice. At the level of projects, MDBs, I mean, Jamie, you and I, you know, we very much think still transport project plus energy project. We do not think integrated transport energy uh, nexus. And so that is the next frontier for us as MDBs. Now, very interestingly enough, when you look at how many countries have, through these various COPs uh, negotiation, sought the nexus and agree on targets that concerns both renewable and electric, electrical vehicles, only a handful of countries. In the G20, we're talking about two or three countries that have set targets for both electrical vehicles and renewable energy. That gives you a, a sense of how much, how much research and how much advocacy we still need to do uh, to convince policymakers to think integrated. My second point is on the financing side. And it was good to hear Michelle talking about money is there. She, she mentioned 1 trillion uh, from green bonds. We did a study uh, a few years uh, back on, on investment needs in the transport sector. And we estimated that the transport sector will require 50 trillion of investment by 2040 to get to sustainability. And of course, it's more than uh, decarbonization, yeah? So it's accessibility for all safety and efficiency. And so in there, the investment gap was estimated at 10 trillion. So green investment bonds, really the way forward. Development banks play their share. I mean, all of them will come to COP with a lot of commitments for climate finance. I know the World Bank will come with its new World Bank Group Climate Action Plan where we are aiming at increasing our share of climate finance for transport from 26 to 35 percent over the next five years. Asian Development Bank is also coming with those, those, uh, this ambition. But, you know, if you look at the amounts we're talking about, this will not be enough. That's clear. So we really need to think about the private sector, and that means de-risking. So uh, the idea is that Climate investment funds, green climate funds, all of those have their role to play and they are playing their role. We are not yet seeing, however, the scale of financing from those funds towards transport. Most of those funds are doing a huge job on the energy side, not yet on the transport side. There are some issues related to matrix, to measure to way of making a case for transport, decarbonized transport in those, in those uh, funds. So we really need to, to really bring those funds into the discussion and convince them that we need to move uh, this agenda at scale. I like the idea of having the guarantees uh, and the uh, insurance company part of the discussion. They have not been. And so we really need to bring those actors into the discussion because the, the way forward will go through them um subsidy will continue to be critical for pushing this agenda on electrical mobility and that has of course fiscal implication that we need to look at so to conclude i would say two things first on the mdb side multilateral development bank side we're doing a lot but we need to do more and the next frontier for us is really to deliver 
those integrated transport energy projects. Um, this can start by articulating the principles that we need to, to, to consider, but then we really now need to come up with those projects, them, those demonstration projects, that this is indeed a viable way forward and that we can mobilize not only you know, countries uh, financing, but also private sector into investing into those, they co-invest, co-investing into those projects. Second element is on sustainable mobility for all. Two years ago, we started uh, this work on the transport energy nexus. Uh, we were really right on, on target uh, with that work. We now need to have those demonstration projects. We had also last year this work on electrical mobility. We unpack a number of issues. We need to continue and come to COP27 uh, with more insight, more research, more data uh, to convince uh, on the way forward. Climate finance can be one element, but we need to look at also a number of other issues. So I very much look forward working with you know, all the partners here uh, on this agenda in the next year or so to be ready for COP27. Looking forward to, to next year. I do think your your next frontier. I hope uh, those in the audience, those listening in at home, uh, also feel the excitement and the positivity that was put in place. And I do believe it's it it, it certainly is the next frontier, as you put. Um, but we need to deliver at scale, and that is the takeaway that I hope we we can all do. We can work together. We can cut, break out of those silos. We can use the excellent examples uh, that we've heard today, and and what take these home with us, and then more importantly, deliver them and deliver them at scale. I'd like to thank all the speakers and all the panelists and everyone who was listening in today, and also uh, an excellent set of series of events today, if I may say so, CCG. Thank you very much and goodbye to everybody. Thank you. Thank you.